tapirs are excellent sentinel species. They point to the problems, you know, they show us uh, where to go and how, you know, certain um, threats that affect them can also affect people. I'm a conservation biologist and I've been um, working on lowland tapers in Brazil for the past 28 years. And I've been doing that through this organization called IPE, Institute for Ecological Research. I'm one of the founders of this organization. We're 32 years old. And uh, for the past 25 years, I've been the chair of the IUCN Taper Specialist Group, which is a group of 120 taper conservationists from all over the world, 27 different countries. Pretty much everything I do is uh, related to taper conservation around the world. Why tapers? What makes them unique and why should we care? First of all, they're, con they're known, they're considered to be living fossils. So they have been around for millions and millions of years and they have dealt with, they've been through several waves of extinction and they have survived. So it's a very successful taxon. So that's very, very special. If, if you have watched um, the Ice Age, uh, you have seen tapirs migrating with the, you know, all the other animals from that time. They are landscape species. They are land wide ranging animals. They move a lot, very long distances. They have gigantic home ranges, 800 um, soccer fields. So very, very big. They need a lot of habitat so that they can find all the resources they need. And they connect different habitats. They connect different ecoregions. So that role, uh, that connection that they provide is very important for the maintenance of these habitats. They're considered to be the gardeners of the forest. They're very powerful seed dispersers. Uh, they're herbivores, they're vegetarian, and 60, more or less 60% of their diet consists of fruit and they eat the fruit, they swallow the seeds, and they walk those long distances that I mentioned, and they defecate. And their, you know, very precious taper poop carries all those really precious seeds. So they, I like to say that they play with biodiversity. They get a seed here, they transport that seed, you know, all the way to a, a place like 10 kilometers from here. They bring seeds back here from that place. So they create biodiversity and they maintain biodiversity. So we have to care about tapers because if there's a certain forest where tapers are present, where, where they're found, it, it's got its composition, it's got its uh, diversity of different species. But if tapers go extinct in that particular forest, that will be in, in a certain amount of time, that will be very, very different and much less diverse. What are the factors affecting Tapirs, should, should we be concerned or are they just get on with their lives? Do we need people like you to concern about them? Yes, we need to be very concerned uh, about lowland tapirs. Something that we need to understand is that these animals, these species, they are distributed throughout South America in 11 different countries, 21 different ecoregions. But if you look at, if you look at the, at the distribution level, you could easily think, well, they're doing well, right? Because they're, they cover all this area, almost, you know, it's continental. But, but if we think about, um, their status, their conditions in, in the, in the different biomes where they're found, that's a whole different story. In Brazil, for instance, we have five different biomes where tapers are found. We have the Amazon, the Atlantic forest, the Cerrado do Pantanal, and the Caatinga. In the Atlantic forest, uh, which is one of the most threatened biomes in the world, we have only 15% of the Atlantic forests left standing. Everything else has been cleared. So uh, when we think tapers in this context, we're thinking small populations, very small forests, pockets of forest, um, disconnected from each other. So that's not the ideal situation for a large mammal, for instance. But if we think Pantanal, the largest, you know, freshwater floodplain in, in the world, in the very center of South America, the, the big swamp, as we like to say in Brazil, and, you know, we have uh, 170,000 square kilometers of habitat and a very large taper population, very healthy, continuous, um, very rich in resources, lots of water. So that's the main stronghold for the species in South America. So when we think 
In terms of tapers, we have to have, you know, that closer look at these different biomes. But the main threats, again, it depends where you are, but roadkill is a big thing and they get hit by cars and killed on the highways. It's a big, big problem, not only for tapers, but also for human beings, for the people like us using these highways, because we're talking about a very large animal, 250 kilos, that's half the size of a horse, right? So it's a, it's a serious crash, people die. We uh, recorded 700 taper carcasses in seven years in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul, all roadkill. And during the same period, 60 people died in those crashes with tapers. We have hunting, like in the Amazon, where we have the indigenous communities hunting for meat, um, sometimes in a very unsustainable way. We have deforestation that still takes place in, in the Cerrado, for instance. We have mining in the Amazon is a big thing, palm oil in the Amazon. We have large-scale agriculture. Uh, when you, th when you see, you know, those, those large sugarcane plantations, the soybean corn plantations, that's usually in the Cerrado, which is the main epicenter of economic development here in, in Brazil. So those are, you know, the combination of the, of all those threats, um, in different parts of Brazil, uh, it's what we're really trying to fight. You've more recently moved into the Amazon, which has been described as taper, taper hell. Yeah. Could you describe why, what that means? Why is the Amazon taper hell when maybe the Pantanal is taper heaven? Taper heaven. Well, the Pantanal, as I said, it's large. 170,000 square kilometers of habitat. And it's really well conserved by private landowners. That's very special. That's something that not a lot of people know. When people hear about the Pantanal, when they see the maps, they see it on television, they think, well, this is a, a big protected area, right? But it's not. The Pantanal, 95% of the Pantanal is privately owned. And the traditional cattle ranching practices that these private landowners apply in that region uh, maintain the Pantanal as it is. And so just a few examples of those practices. They don't clear the forest because they, they need to keep the shade for the, for the cows because that increases productivity. They don't replace the native grasses with exotic grasses. They keep those native, very nutritious grasses. They keep a low, very low density of heads of cattle in their fields and they rotate. So, those are practices that are used only in the Pantanal because that's what that environment sustains. It's sustainable for, for that environment. So that maintains the Pantanal as the haven for tapers, very much free of threats, large population reproducing really well, very healthy. We have assessed the health of tapers in the Pantanal. They're very healthy. And, and so that's taper haven for us. And in the Amazon, we have both situations. We have a situation of taper haven in the Amazon as well, in the very middle of the biome, in the, in the big protected areas, in the remote areas in the Amazon. And we actually considered going there and working there and, and, and studying tapers in another haven situation. But we also have the edges of the Amazon. You know, we have the famous southern arc of the first station uh, along the southern edge of the, of the Amazon, where, you know, the Amazon is gone. It's no longer there. The forest is gone. Everything has been cleared. And therefore taper habitat, right? And, but it's still taper habitat. They're still there. You know, we're not talking about populations of these animals. We're talking about individuals wandering through this um, completely destroyed landscape right and trying to survive somehow trying to find the resources they need so we we made this decision that we didn't want to establish another ecological study in taper heaven we wanted to go to the areas where they need us the most so 2021 you started working in the amazon correct um what are the sort of immediate changes influence you can have and what are the sort of longer term uh, impacts you can have to benefit these animals and other animals the short-term changes is just, just gathering data and providing that data to uh, whoever can apply, whoever can use that data besides us um, for the benefit of these animals. When, when it comes to roadkill, we have information, we have numbers, we know how many animals are dying on the highways every year. So that, and we know the places, the hotspots of, uh, you know, taper roadkill and giant anteater roadkill and uh, many other species. So we can provide, you know, those tools, we can provide those maps, that information to 
the managers of those highways and help them work with them on the development of mitigation strategies. So that's short term, that's urgent. It's something that we, we need to be doing all the time. But there's things like um, uh, contamination by pesticides. When, when we talk about large scale agriculture, soy, sugarcane, corn, we're, you know, inevitably talking about pesticides as well. It's all part of that production, part of that crop. Uh, and we found that tapers are, have been contaminated in the Cerrado of Mato Grosso do Sul and in the Amazon in, uh, in Mato Grosso state, in places where people also live. So uh, one year after that sampling for taper contamination, we went back to that community and we sampled people. Uh, just to find out if, you know, if, if those communities were contaminated as well. And yes, you know, 40% of the people were contaminated. So we need to think about what to do, you know, uh, regarding contamination. Um, but it's a very powerful industry. It's, you know, we're talking about labs. We're talking about the, the manufacturers of these products. We're talking about a very corrupt business in Brazil, uh, very involved with all, you know, the politics and everything. So it's more long term and it's something that we're trying to fight through the press. We're trying to talk about it, you know, nationally, internationally, and trying to find ways to deal with this. But the main thing for us is to generate data to gather scientific information, top quality, and be, we want to be able to provide that information to all the different stakeholders that can use that for the benefit of animals and their habitats. You had huge wildfires in 2020 and 2021. Yeah. How much is climate change affecting habitat and these animals? And what specifically can and have you been doing about that? The fires in 2020, they were a big wake up call for us because we didn't really consider fire to be a big threat for tapers because they they move long distances. We always thought that they could, you know, move away from the fires. But the scale of the fires in 2020, it was, it was a whole different level. It was a, you know, big canopy fire. So they couldn't get out. So we lost lots of individuals just like that, burned by the fires. They, they died. Uh, they lost a lot of habitat. So they couldn't come back to the area. So, uh, lots of individuals suffered. The, that impact, that post-fire impact in their habitats and many other consequences. So it's, it's had a huge impact on taper populations, not only in the Pantanal, in the Amazon as well, in the Cerrado. So we raised funds and the, the first line of action for us was to help the rescue um, teams, the people who were, you know, taking care of the tapers that were found to be burned and uh, just trying to, you know, help them survive. We provided funds, we provided equipment, materials, everything. But very soon into that process, we realized that there were lots of uh, community fire brigades just, you know, fighting these fires, just gigantic fires with very little equipment, with very little training, no capacity whatsoever. So risking their lives and uh, we felt like we had to support that. And then the owners of the ranch where we work in the Pantanal, it's a, as I said, it's a private land. They came to us and they said, well, the work you guys are doing is amazing. You know, it's, it's fantastic to know that all these different people are getting equipment, are getting the training to fight the fires. But what about us? What about us land owners? We're still here fighting the same fires, you know, wearing flip flops and, uh, and uh, trying our best to do this. And we thought, yeah, well, yeah, that's right. So, the, and it's 95% of this place is owned by these people. So we might as well just, of course, it makes total sense to work with them and create brigades for them as well. So we created the first um, community brigade um, uh, led by private landowners in the Pantanal. And we're talking about 22 ranches and 1,600 square kilometers of Pantanal that we're able to protect through this uh, volunteer brigade. There's a huge political element to, to how forests are maintained and changed. You've worked on this for the best part of three decades. How have you seen political change in Brazil impact the work you do? Um, how has that changed since 2023? What was it like before 2023 and historically? Well, we've had, we've had our own hell, right? For four years in Brazil and, uh, four years of, uh, the, of the mandate of, uh, the Presidente Bolsonaro. It was a horrible 
period for conservation for the environment in my country. Um, he made sure to uh, dismantle all the environmental agencies, all the legislation, the environmental legislation that we had in place, all the different committees and, and positions and task forces and everything. And the funding completely disappeared. Uh, all the major donors for, for the environment and for conservation in Brazil, they, they moved out, they left. The damage has been made, and uh, and Lula and Marina Silva, our, our our minister of the environment in the country, they've spent a good chunk of you know their first two years rebuilding all of that, all that structure to make sure that we try and control the damage that has been made. Is there optimism for 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 the future? There is optimism for the future. Yes, we we have lots of people like myself, lots of. Uh, excellent conservationists, communicators, environmental legislators, all kinds of uh, conservation professionals in the country trying to do their best to, you know, either make the situation better or just completely change whatever is bad at the moment. So um, there's place for op optimism, but it has to be realistic optimism. Uh, we have to make sure that we continue to act. Patricia Medici. That's been really fascinating. Thank you so much for talking to me. Oops. <laughs>